I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I'm grateful that you would spend some of your evening with us tonight. I hope you learned something tonight. I'm really honored and privileged and proud to be able to introduce my wife, Carla Erskine, Carla Godwin Erskine. Thanks for coming and sharing your story with us tonight, Carla. I'm really happy to do so, Earl. It's actually really an honor. And before you start, there are a few things that I would like to say. I hope I don't get too emotional. But I need to share with those listening when we came out of the church and what type of a person you are, your integrity, your truthfulness. I mean, you never sugarcoat anything. You always have told the straight truth. You're so honorable. You've never been one to listen to a dirty joke, no one to, to swear. And I love you so much, and I do trust you. And I heard in a uh, lesson one time that more than love between a couple is trust. That is the most important thing. And I was criticized when you came out of the church by family members that said I would follow you anywhere. And I just have so much trust in you. Mm. And I praise God that we could do this together. It has been really interesting and it's joyful. Been, hasn't? It really has. Thanks. I appreciate you saying all that, Carla. Well, as we usually do, um, tell us a little bit about your upbringing in the, in the church. Well, I'm, I guess I'm a third or fourth generation Mormon. My grandparents migrated or came across the ocean in the early 1900s on both sides. Yeah. And they had um, family that disowned them for joining the church, but they came here and both families raised fine children uh, to believe in the LDS church. Sure, sure. and. My mom and her mother was, my grandma was almost like a second mom to me. We spent so much time together and they were just such devout LDS. My dad was not very active in the church, but he worked for the church. And he did a lot of the um, refurbishing in the temple. Salt of, Lake Temple. Yeah, the yeah. Salt Lake Temple, um, you know, when they go in for their remodeling or once a year thing, whatever they do. And he also got on scaffolding and got up and would re-gold leaf the angel Moroni. Wow. In fact, we have a piece of that gold leaf somewhere at home yeah. in our memorabilia. Yeah. And that was always a treasure to me. Yeah. And one of the most memorable experiences that I had as a child, and I still tear up about this because it was so special, and it has been difficult to leave the church. But when I was eight years old, I had the opportunity to sing in a children's choir 
in the Salt Lake Tabernacle as we introduced the song to the church for the first time, I am a child of God. Yeah. And um, President David O. McKay walked right in front of me with long white hair. I remember the pictures I saw of him, he had short hair. Yeah. But he came in with long white hair and I think maybe he had a beard and was walking with a cane, but that is such a special memory to me from my childhood. There was the prophet. Huh? The prophet, and yeah. uh, he was so old <laughs> with his white hair. But um, I remember being a lark, blue bird and a seagull, and uh, my mother was always in the Relief Society presidency, or she was young women's president, or mutual in those days. Yeah. And so I was totally involved in the church and loved my years as a teen with her always in leadership positions. She always wrote road shows and stuff. Didn't oh she? yeah, she wrote road shows and of course I was in all of them and yeah. the, my life was the church. Yeah, I and know it, you earned a lot of awards, a Young Women's Awards. Oh, individual awards and mm -hmm. um, I think it was still called Gleaners then and uh, I think that Golden was Gleaner. Oh, Golden Gleaner. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it was, because I met you in M Men and Gleaners, as I remember. And um, just always was such. Yeah. Seminary? Oh, yeah, seminary? I was a four year graduate from mm -hmm. seminary. Yeah. And I don't know if I mentioned I got my individual awards. Right. And um, was just involved with my mom in all her callings. So the church was everything. It Did was. Did you it have a testimony life. of it, do you think? Well, I knew it was true. As a youth, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. You know, I... You never uh, questioned it, I guess. No, I never questioned it, especially because my grandparents had been disowned, but they knew the church was true and had come across the ocean. I mean, I never gave it a second thought that this this wasn't but true. there could be any problems with the church, no. and you never heard anything that kind of question no. made you question or no anything? i really didn't wow. and uh knew i wanted to marry a return Oof. missionary that was important to me and um i will say my father any calling that my mother had he was called to that calling yeah even though he didn't attend church church very much he was able to go to the temple with diana and myself when we were married, he would get himself ready. When we were married in the temple, yeah, he, when we he were got married ready. To go, yeah. and he always turned his paychecks over to my mom, and she always paid, paid a full tithing. tithing. <laughs> Their whole well, marriage life. he must life. get some blessings for that, don't you think? Oh, I guess, I, guess. I don't know, but uh -huh. he, uh, I mean, he helped my mom with all her lessons, all her yeah. callings, total support yeah. there from him. So a good example then. Wonderful. Wonderful, sweet man. So we marry, we find each other and yeah. get married? Well, we met in Emmett and Gleaners, yeah. and it was a quick engagement. Yeah. And uh, well, I was a return missionary and told to get going, so. Uh, I know, and you wanted. <laughs> we it got, was the next thing to do. <laughs> we got engaged in October, and you wanted to get married in December. Right, but that wasn't going to no, work No, my out. mom had a fit, so yeah. she wanted us to wait till June, but. We compromised and got married in February. She gave me the February date, and so I picked the 5th. I mean, it, as early as I could in February, so. Uh -huh, that's anyway. true. Okay, so what what do we do for a while? Well, we are just active in the church and live yeah. our lives and. Uh, Have four kids. And we do, two, yeah. our three boys okay. and one girl, and two are now out of the church, as you know and two are in the church and hold leadership positions in their wards and stake. And uh, that they both married return missionaries, both of our boys. Yeah. And uh, it's just been a really hard time. And I think that if you say anything that I have lost or that we have lost, I guess would be respect yeah. From the four of them and the two of oh those four with yeah, their the, the two wives, married kids. Yeah, yeah. and um, they're heartbroken. Yeah. Uh, we I had we had one son just cry on Christmas in our home. Yeah. 
Now, before we get too far into our journey out, you had a couple of experiences that you wanted to share, I think, and things that maybe God was kind of tapping you on the shoulder along the way. And Yeah, I appreciate you reminding me of that. Yeah. But one of my um, favorite pictures has always been the picture of Jesus standing at the door and he's knocking, yeah. but there's no doorknob on his side of the door. Yeah. And we need to let him in, otherwise he has no way to come in. And as I look back and I think over the years, I know that this great, wonderful God that I really didn't know about at that time, I know that he was working in my life and that the, they were, he was knocking. I was opening the door, but I wasn't letting him in. Hmm. And I had a few questions that I wondered about with the church, but being so naive and so committed, I never thought to investigate them. What was one of those questions? Well, the first one was, why didn't Jesus talk about temple marriage, temple ordinances, you know, like baptism for the dead? Maybe he didn't know they were important. I don't know, but he didn't talk about them in the Bible. Yeah. And they weren't in the Book of Mormon either. No, they're not there either. No, and that was one thing. And then I always wished that I was an adult convert to the church so oh. that I could be rebaptized. And really be clean. Huh? And really be forgiven of my sins thus far. And uh, it always bothered me that children at age eight were so accountable and for their sins. I mean, what sins does an eight-year-old commit? Well, and on the other hand, how how much can they really turn themselves over to Christ? I mean, there could be a few here and there, but at eight, what do you know of Christ and being willing to turn yourself to Him? And to represent Him. Yeah. You know, that's just really an interesting thought. And, you know, as I, I held my callings in the church, I've been a, a primary president, been in, that was always my favorite place to be was in primary. And I've been in the state primary a couple of times and um, in Relief Society presidencies and in the state Relief Society mm -hmm. presidencies. But my favorite place was always primary because these little children, that's where the angels were. Yeah. But as I moved on in my life, I had two other, I think, well, the first one was kind of an eye opener and the second experience was very profound. Well, tell us the first me. one first. Okay, the first one was about five years ago, there was a meteor shower. Right. And you and I went up Immigration Canyon and parked in an open field area to watch the meteor shower. It was about midnight. And I remember thinking, how great is this God? What a wonderful God he is. He's so huge. He's so much bigger than I ever imagined. And I thought to myself, I want to worship the first God. I don't want to worship a God in the LDS church that one time had lived on an earth, was a sinner, had multiple wives in heaven. He wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to worship the one and only God. An almighty God. The yeah. almighty God. And I was still LDS, of course, and thought, well, I can do that on my own. I'm, that's just who I'm deciding I'm going to worship. Well, I know you shared that with me at the time, and I totally dismissed it. It didn't impact, on, it didn't, didn't impact me at all in that regard. I guess right. it just wasn't you my were already questioning, to, though, weren't you? But it wasn't about God and Jesus ever. It was always about the doctrines the of the church. But. Right. And then the other experience was we were on a family picnic and um, with all of our children. They were all there. And we were up at Donut Falls in Big Cottonwood Canyon. And I remember hiking up to the falls, which is unusual for me because I'm not very athletic took me quite a while to get there and to get down this steep cliff. But I remember walking across the river and I sat on a huge rock on the other side under an even bigger pine tree. 
and I looked up at the grandeur of the falls and could hear the sound of the water rustling down and I felt the cool spray of the water on my face and I looked up at this these steep cliffs on either side of this canyon and their majesty and I could see the pine trees at the top and surrounding this whole thing was the most beautiful blue sky and I started to sob and I could feel the presence of God all around me and I realized what a supreme glorious God he was and I truly was worshiping the true God even though I was so LDS at the time but I remember hikers would come by and several young men said to me are you all right and i said oh i'm just fine and i just sat there sobbing mm. i must have sat there for half an hour and i cried all the way back down wow. the mountain i still had opened the door for jesus but i hadn't let him in yeah what um what happens next i guess <laughs> well what happens next about a year or two later is my husband is very unhappy, yeah. very frustrated, and I didn't know why. Yeah. You know, you'd retired before me, and then I retired, and I thought, boy, Earl can't get used to me being home. Yeah. And uh, so finally, and the kids came from Phoenix for, for, Christmas, for Christmas, our one uh, son and his family, and uh, they noticed a difference in you and said, what is the matter with dad? And I didn't know what uh, was wrong. I said, I have no idea, but he's so frustrated. And finally I said to you, well, there is something, but it's pretty big and I, or you, what did I say? You said it's life altering and I don't want to tell you. And I never for a minute, I thought you'd had a vision or an angel had come to you. But I thought I you'd think I'd had an affair or something. I never <laughs> thought you'd had an affair because you are so honorable and trustworthy. I had no doubt that that, Didn't you know, you. that you weren't doing something like that. But I knew there was something big. So finally in February of, was it 2011? Mm -hmm. You finally told me. You came in the front room. I was sitting there faithfully reading my Book of Mormon. I think we should use the word pester in there somewhere about <laughs> your pestering me. But anyway, I finally can <laughs> finally uh, acquiesced and said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll tell you. And I had this long list of stuff, right? Yes, and those that know me would appreciate the word pest. I mean, <laughs> I was after you. For several months. Are you going to tell me today? Are you going to tell me tomorrow? That's, okay. Yeah, that's Anyway, the so truth. I finally tell you. So you finally tell me, and it was just so surreal. I had no idea that was anything that you were going to say. It was just so shocking that I don't know how I felt, but the next few days were really hard for me, and my one son that lives here in Salt Lake we went to Phoenix to visit our, my other son. And um, I was so glad to get away from you. Yeah. And I didn't want to come home to you. And the next six weeks were a little hairy at our house. We didn't fight, but I was very sullen and depressed and you were trying to tell me things. And um, finally it started to click but I had to see everything for myself that you had found. Everything was in church books. Nothing was anti-Mormon, mm -hmm. was all approved things. And so I told you these things, or you told me these things. I had to read them for myself and look at the documentation. Yeah. And then finally I started to understand where you were coming from and decided for myself that the church wasn't true well, what were we gonna do? I mean, I was serving in the Relief Society presidency at this time. You were, I think, in the high priest group. In the high priest group leadership at this time and had been in the bishopric in this ward. And um, we thought, we've gotta go tell the bishop. 
and we knew that he would ask us, have you prayed? Have you fasted? Have you been to the temple? And so we went to the temple for the last time. And I know that um, we were going through for someone else, not for ourselves. But I had a really time, hard time with the um, promises that were asked of me. And the hardest one was, of course, that I would give everything to the church. To the church. And I thought, to the church? You know, what about to the Lord? Yeah. And then when we were sitting in the terrestrial room, just before we went through the veil, of course, I had the prayer. And I veiled my face, and I was pleading with God, please tell me if the church is true or not. I mean, my whole eternity depends on this. Yeah. And a voice came to me and said, it's not true, let it go. What a joyous moment that was for me. I didn't know what was ahead, yeah. but that was so joyful. So I get through and walk across the floor in the celestial room, and <laughs> she's sitting away in a chair quite a ways away with this big smile on her face. And I'm thinking, oh no, I am in deep trouble here. <laughs> but gratefully you said, told me about this little sense you had uh, uh, and that, that it wasn't true, let it go. And right. You made thought my day. I was, yeah. yeah. I thought we were going to say, I know the church is true. We're going. No. I mean, it was all I could do not to giggle yeah. in the celestial room. And yeah. that's, you know, it's silent in there. So we end up going to a Bible study, right? We did. Yeah. Um, we, we went on uh, in April. It was general conference that Sunday, and we thought it was really safe. We were just going to a Bible study. Tell up family at, we've gone to a Bible study. Right. Yeah. Up at the U. I met Sean McCraney. Yeah. You tried to force him on me over the, those initial six weeks. <laughs> and I said, I can't stand that. I can't take anymore. <laughs> and we went up there to that Bible study. And I walked in the room and burst into tears. And he prayed with us. You know, I'd never had that happen. He put his arms around us and prayed with us, just like Christians do. And we'd never experienced no, that, had it, we? It was so unbelievable. And then um, I cried. I sobbed in there for the next month. And then when you and I were well, at home. Well, that was because the Bible was opening up, right? Well, I'd never read these things. Yeah. As LDS, that Bible, <laughs> I mean, when I had my triple combination before the quad came, yeah. I would leave that Bible at home. Didn't need it. It was heavy, and I didn't need it at church. And I'd never read the Bible except for a passage here or there for a lesson. Oh. And so um, this was so new to me, so absolutely wonderful. And I cried and cried for a couple of months. Well, we started reading John at home. And again, we were sitting there crying because scriptures that we'd read before, I certainly had. I've read right. the New Testament many times. They, w they weren't there when I read them the first time. Mm -hmm. I know somebody put them in there because they just weren't there. Well, I had never read them, so I didn't <laughs> know. But we'd take turns reading five verses, and we were just sobbing. Yeah. And then my first experience in a Christian church was, I believe, in August. Yeah. I, it was my utopia day, is what I've called it. It was utter utopia. We went up to Brigham, and we went to um, one of the Christian yeah, churches. Yeah, Aldersgate. I think it was a Methodist church. Uh, a special young friend of ours was being baptized there that day, and I couldn't believe it when I walked in. There were Kleenexes, or there were boxes on each row tissue, yeah. of tissue, and people. I saw no ties. I saw no nylons. Yeah. I saw lots of jeans, and. There was a band on the stage. And, and the then, music and the words. Oh, the music. And then everybody stood up to sing. And the uh, words were up front where we could see them. And I swayed with the music and sang these words. And for the first time in my life, I realized that I was worshiping Jesus. I'd never done that in the LDS church. Yeah. There was such freedom and love in my heart. 
and everyone there was so happy. And um, it was just such a profound experience for me. And it just, uh, it just kept going from there, didn't it? Yeah, it just got better and better. Well, what do you think the LDS miss? That certainly this praising of Jesus and they the Bible. Do. Well, and in the LDS Church, I don't think I've said this yet, but in their sacrament meetings when they sing the hymns, yeah. there's so many, many that don't sing. Right. And those that do sing, it's real, they really, yeah. really don't want to be singing. Right. And it's pretty quiet and humdrum. And this was so opposite. Anyway, how much time do we have? You've got two minutes, my dear. Oh, shoot. There's so much to say. Did you, did you want to say something specific? I did, and I even wrote it down because I didn't want to miss anything. Okay. And I want to say this to the LDS, but I know this is a question you asked before. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to me? As LDS, he was my older brother. Um, Satan's brother. <laughs> Satan's brother. He suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, but I never knew where he fit in. He was, he was not as important as Heavenly Father was. Yeah. And here was Heavenly Father, here's the Holy Ghost, and here's Jesus. But I never, never knew where he fit in. And um, President Hinckley, in his interview with Larry King, had said, they did not worship the this traditional is, Jesus. Yeah. This is not the Jesus that we worship. And um, One minute, my dear. Oh, one minute. Okay, who Jesus is to me now. Yeah. He is my bridegroom, and I am his bride. And um, there is such excitement in this, and his spirit dwells inside of me. And it's there 24 hours a day, whether I sin or whether I don't sin. And there's nothing that I can do to earn to earn my salvation. You've been saved by grace. And I've been saved by grace. Through His righteousness. Through right? His righteousness for sins past, present, and future. Wow. And I know that someday I will live with Him again. And I know in John it says, I am... Grace be. Excuse me? Hurry. <laughs> oh, he says in there, I am the truth, the, way the, the truth life, and the, and the life. No man cometh to the Father. Love you, Carla. But through me. <laughs>